God's love for us. In recent times, on a Sunday morning, we've all been together in Mark's Gospel, looking at the cross together, where the Lord Jesus Christ cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. But tonight we're going to focus on this verse from Romans, Romans 5, verse 8, which simply reads, But God demonstrates his own love towards us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that's worth repeating, isn't it? And just chewing over every single word, really. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that whilst we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We're going to consider together tonight, as best we can, the love of God. Such a necessary focus for us as a people. That we are a people who know and are bathed in the fact that we're loved of God. I came across this quote last week from Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who needs no introduction to very many of you. And he said this, I was so heartened to read it, he said, the greatest characteristic of the greatest saints in all ages has always been their realisation of God's love to them. The greatest characteristic of the greatest saints in all ages has always been their realisation of God's love to them. That love which has now been shed abroad in our hearts by the Spirit and which has been demonstrated to us in this, that whilst we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So we're going to make our way fairly briefly through the verse. But I would encourage you to chew on the wonderful truth. If you have your Bible with you, have it open at Romans 5 and verse 8. First of all, we read, but God, but God. Two things to say there, of course. For many of us in evangelicalism over the years, the word but has become a much-loved word, hasn't it? The word but. It simply introduces, does it not, a contrast. This is one thing, but here is another. When it's followed by God, but God, it's always introducing the most glorious grace and mercy. I mean, here is something, but God. I mean, yes, scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. That's possible. Somebody might die and give up their life for a good man. But let's lift the roof. But God demonstrates his own love to us in this. And if you're a believer here tonight, then you know that you are evidence of a but God. When Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, he reminds them that once they were dead in their trespasses and sins in which they used to live, according to the power of the age and this world, and then what does he say? But God, you were once dead, you were once living this way, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love for us, has made us alive in Christ. We were all dead, but God, and he made us alive. Or into the next chapter of Romans, chapter 6 and verse 23, the wages of sin is death. And we've all sinned, and the wages of sin is death. But God, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. A wonderful but God. A contrast introducing enormous grace and mercy. And here, of course, he is comparing somebody who might give their life for a good man with his great love for us. What can we say about God but God? Well, we could be here all night. We've sung many helpful truths this evening. But in the context of Romans, what can we say about God? Well, in chapter 1 we read, For the wrath of God 
is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. From that we gather that this God is a God of truth. This God is a God of light. This God is a God who is reliable and trustworthy. This God is a righteous God. We know from chapter 1 and verse 20 that this is the God who has created the heavens and the earth. That he has made known to us in that creation his invisible attributes, his eternal power and Godhead. That he is the incorruptible God. So here Paul is simply saying, well, yes, somebody might give their life for a good man, but, but God, the one seated on the throne, the one who is righteous in all of his being and in all of his ways, the God who is mighty in his power and in his wisdom, he demonstrates his own love. It's this God whose love is demonstrated to you. So let's look at this love. This is the God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but he demonstrates his own love. There's a different quality of love now going to be shown in this verse to that which was shown in the previous verse. Because this God who is holy, holy, holy is also love. And I wonder whether evangelicalism has really grasped that this God is love. Holy, a judge, righteous, just, but also his love. The Apostle John writes these words to Christians. He says, Beloved, let's love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this the love of God was manifested towards us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. We love him because he first loved us. He is love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so here in this verse, there's a contrast. And we're looking at God, who is just and righteous and truthful, and he demonstrates his own love. It's not a reflected love, it's his own love, an extraordinary love, because it's the love of God himself who is love. It must be the very best of loves. It's his own love. It must be wider, longer, deeper, higher than any other love. It must be wide, wide as the ocean and high as the heavens above. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus. It is higher than the hills. It must be deeper than the seas. This is the love of God in which we as a people have been saturated. We've not just caught the odd droplet bouncing off the top of the wave, have we? Here is love vast as the ocean, loving kindness as a flood. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus, vast, unmeasured, boundless, free, rolling like a mighty ocean in its fullness over me. This is the mighty love of Jesus. We're going to sing that at the close. It's his agape love. And here he demonstrates to us his own love. His own love is demonstrated to us. An interesting word. You're probably aware that some of the translations says God commends his love to us. God shows and makes clear to us his love in this. He makes his love to us conspicuous and plain in this. But the word also means to stand near or to be in union. And I would never normally commend the message, but the message says, 
God put his love on the line for us. And that is a translation, well, a paraphrase, which is dealing with part of what the word means in that God stands together with his love most in this. He stands together in union with his love most in this. Somebody might die for a good man, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in this. Good question to ask, what is love? What is love? I've always said it's the wanting and working for the object's ultimate good as long as it depends upon you. There's an object of your love and you want and you work for the ultimate good of that object as much as it depends upon you. And this God who is holy and majestic and also in love wants and works for the ultimate good of the objects of his love. And the word love is associated so much with the cross. He is the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Friends, we're partaking tonight of emblems which reminds us of the vast love of God towards us. And that's the next staggering thing, isn't it, as we make our way through the verse. But God, his own love demonstrates towards us. Well, you and I know what it is to love something which is attractive and beautiful and has, in our view, some merit. That's what we often most understand, don't we, as, as love. You know, it's the beautiful princess that the prince falls in love with. Something beautiful about them intrinsically. Who does God love? Well, he shows his own love here towards us. And just to stick to what Romans says, what does it say about us here? Well, verse 6, it says that we are ungodly. He demonstrates his own love towards the ungodly. Verse 8 says that Christ died for sinners. He died for a people who by themselves, in and of themselves, are wretched. He died for a people who, in whom in whose flesh there's no good. He dies for a people who are depraved in every part of their life. He died for a people who stain everything they say, do, think or desire by their sin. He died for a people who would never on earth glorify him as he ought to be glorified. He died for a people who are by nature very conceited, arrogant, proud and full of themselves. He died for a people who desire to be but fail to be humble and holy and obedient and loving and pure. He died for a people who acts deplorably and very often by their own actions deny him, defy him, despise him, dishonour him. We sing, don't we, that we're the ugly, the defiled, the filthy, and the undeserving. But we read here that he died for the ungodly and for sinners. Those who hadn't loved him, those who'd broken his law, those who'd murdered in their hearts, lusted, stolen, offended the Holy One, committed treason. Those who by nature are idolaters who, as it were, they've gone to the mantelpiece of their own lounge, and if there was a, a vase there standing for God, they've smashed it out of the way, and they put their own puny little idols in its place day after day after day. And this God has enveloped such people in his staggering love. Verse 10 says that they are his enemies. He hasn't looked down and seen people who love him at all, I'll love you back. He loves his enemies under his wrath, we're told here in Romans. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. God gave them over to a debased mind 
to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death not only do the same but also approve of those who practice them that's the description the people who are without excuse who he fervently loves with an everlasting love but God his own love demonstrates towards us And that love is also demonstrated in what it brings to us. It brings the very, very best, doesn't it? It brings the best gift, what we don't have, what we most need, what we don't deserve, what we could never earn, what we could never buy. We read here, verse 9, that we're justified. It brings us to that point where God declares of us righteous, 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 righteous. Through our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, God looks upon us and declares, mine, 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 righteous, righteous. Verse 9 tells us that we've been saved effectively, that we've been saved from the wrath to come. Have you ever meditated upon that, what it will be like to be in that chasm where there's a weeping and wailing and a gnashing of teeth? And we've been saved from that, not for righteousness sake, for we have none. But he saved us from that to a bliss of ever gazing upon his face and knowing his favour for an eternity which will never, ever, ever run out. He's brought us justification. He's brought us salvation, verses 10 and 11. He's brought us reconciliation. We are reconciled to God through Christ once and for all. We are to reckon ourselves dead indeed to sin and alive to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We've been reconciled. We've been adopted. We've been clothed in his perfect righteousness. And how? The verse tells us, Christ died for us. Christ, the Messiah King, a man, died. The most costly love Love can only ever really be known from the actions that it prompts. True love gives. The greatest love gives the most. And Christ so loved you and me that he didn't think twice about coming to lay down his life in that priceless way in that agonizing death in which he saw the wrath of God turned aside from us to be faced and absorbed by him as he bore all of our sins in his body on the tree and was forsaken. It was taught in the Old Testament, wasn't it? You cannot approach a holy God apart from the way of sacrifice and blood sacrifice. And each one of us here tonight, if we're believers... Our sacrifice on which we put our hands on his head is the Lord Jesus Christ, and that satisfies God entirely. It is finished, he cries. The debt is paid. It's all paid. There's no more to pay. We've been set free because Christ has offered himself for us a sacrifice for our sins. He's the great high priest who approaches the altar with his own blood in order that we would be put right with God. He's our substitute. And so the outcome tonight is that we read these words and we understand them a little. and We thank God that we, for what we do understand. But we understand that through this, which we're about to do in remembrance of him, we have been brought to God. Mentioned this morning, I think, in the closing prayer. 1 Peter 3.18 for the righteous has died for the unrighteous to bring us to God. 
And that's where we are. We've been set free from sin and Satan and death and hell. We've been set free to do the very thing for which we were created, which is to know and enjoy and to love our God. He has redeemed us from every lawless deed to purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. And so tonight, we bathe in his love. We remember his cross. And we remember two things. What do we bring to the cross? Only our sin. Only our sin. And what do we bring to this table tonight? Well, along with that, we now bring the faith that God has freely given to us. And when we come to the cross, it tells us all we ever need to know about ourselves. It's only our sin. But it's here that he demonstrates to us his own love. We are more wretched than ever we conceive, but we're certainly more loved than we've ever yet realized. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in this, that whilst we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So when we come to the offer, the bread and the wine, let's 